Uh, we, uh, our batch uh, was sent to Camp Borden. Those of us who were selected as fi for fighter training, uh, mates who were selected for multi-engine work, they went off to other parts of Canada um, to fly Cessnas. We were on Harvard's. Uh, I pranged one on my first solo. And they warned us, don't use too much rudder because it will automatically unlock the tail wheel and act like a caster. And my mates said when I came in on my first solo landing, they were all watching and they could see the rudder going bang, 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 which meant I landed with the tail wheel unlocked. This is when I suddenly realised I was losing it because of this unlocking tail wheel and around she went and crashed, the undercart collapsed and then that awful side of the prop stopping and being bent and looking back at you. And a, and a Harvard, or any aircraft, is very, very low on the ground when the undercart the cart's broken. And I looked across, and there's our uh, CFI, Chief Flying Instructor, Squadron Leader Hiltz, uh, was screaming across towards me. Uh, he came right up alongside the aircraft, and I think by, uh, that, by that time I'd climbed out. And I remember he was very white-faced and said, what happened? I said, uh, oh, a ground loop. He said, just a ground loop, huh? Mm -hmm. He reached in and he turned off every switch I should have turned off, like petrol, electrics, everything. And I hadn't done any of that. <laughs> and, but I'll never forget the way he said, just a ground loop, huh? And then we worked out there was 5,000 bucks worth of damage to that aircraft. That's a lot of money in, in 42. And that's when I thought I'd be scrubbed. But Brand, and uh, there was another guy called uh, Pumped Off some Booskill, Canadian. And uh, between them, they straightened out the strange tendency I had not to be able to keep it absolutely straight when landing, and which stood me in good stead years later when I flew mosquitoes. Oh, my first stop, I nearly flew into the mountains of Turkey. Very interesting. Just missed them. Uh, stupid, stupid stupid flying. Um, uh, I was determined to not have any unsuccessful sorties, we used to say. And I took off and they said, we think there's some cloud up ahead, but careful because be, there'll be a lot of it. And uh, I flew off from Cyprus. We had an advance flight in Cyprus and I was covering all the, uh, wars, uh, the islands and I think it was Eastern Dodecanese group where the Germans were very, very firmly entrenched in all that area. And I was supposed to take photographs of certain targets and uh, hit the cloud, and it seemed to me to be pretty endless. And I think I'd seen too many war movies or something, but I thought I would heroically go down under the cloud to low level and see what I could see, uh, thinking I was well clear of Turkey, uh, but I wasn't. And uh, I suddenly found myself in a valley with mountains going up either side into this ten tenths cloud. So that seemed not to be a good idea, so I climbed up through the cloud, realised that it couldn't possibly see the target and came back. And I was annoyed about that because it was my first first operational flight technically was an unsuccessful sortie. And uh, you didn't want to have too many of those for your own ego, I suppose. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it was a funny feeling because you're flying a fighter aircraft, normally designed to fly with other aircraft, and you're on, absolutely on your own. You've got no guns, um, just your long-range tanks, and uh, excellent cameras. Uh, we used to fly with either 20-inch 20, uh, 20 or 36-inch lens vertical cameras, and if we did our, our arithmetic right, we sort of perfect stereoscopic photographs, 3D pictures. And for the other one, the, the oblique camera, I think it was a 14 inch, um, and it was much easier to cover your target, but you usually did that at 300 feet. So we did those, they very really strictly rationed those, those, air, those flights because the, the casualty rate was pretty hefty on the low level ones. And you knew darn well that the moment you turned those cameras on, you had to be straight and level and so did the German gunners know that you were going to be straight and level for probably, I don't know, 10 seconds or I forget, a time interval of three or four seconds. Oh, no, it'd be more than that. <clears throat> but to do it properly, you had to fly straight and level and 
to give the photographic interpreters a go. And uh, we were very, very inexperienced. And uh, but that was the situation. And my navigator, Bill Hunter, an RAF navigator, who'd been shot down on bow fighters on his first tour, and uh, he came to our squadron with a whole group of navigators. And uh, when we did our first air experience flight together, I went round four times in that mossy before I could get it on the ground. I either held off too high or came in slightly sideways or started to swing. Uh, but I remember Bill sitting in the nav seat, which was just at my right, but back a little bit. And uh, as we taxied in, and he didn't say a word, all these hairy landing attempts. And, but as we were taxiing in, he said, did you have trouble judging your height off the ground? I said, well, yeah, I did. He said, well, he said, I can see the starboard wheel from my little window there. He said, would you like me to tell you when you're getting close to the ground? I said, oh, I'd love that. So as we were coming in, he'd be saying, you're getting close, you're getting close, check, 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 you're nearly there, you're nearly there, OK, you're on the ground. And we did a whole tour of ops together with him virtually flying the aircraft from the right-hand seat. By then, in 19, this is early 1944, they'd developed some amazing uh, box barrage techniques where they'd have a cluster of guns. I forget how many there were in each cluster. Um, so that when the, when the uh, anti-aircraft stuff was bursting around, you would have been half a dozen, boom, and then, you know, all out there. And very soon the sky was, you know, black with those things. And uh, everyone think, can I get through all of this? Uh, and often you wouldn't know you were being shot at because the, if it burst below and behind, uh, but occasionally, I know on one occasion, we landed and there was a, a, a burst of 88 mil smack in the middle of one of our photographs. And so that if it had been, I don't know, 50 feet higher, we wouldn't have known what hit us. Then they, we heard that they'd got the 105 millimeter, we were told they were, uh, which was, uh, they, they had a, uh, they chased us up a bit higher. But I can remember losing my voice, I got such a shock, when there was a burst right in front of me. We were iced up over Athens, which was very heavily defended, and I remember scraping a little bit of the ice, the interior ice away from the windscreen so I could see, like driving a car on a misty morning before we had air conditioning. And uh, Bill, the navigator, is down in the nose, and he's doing left, left, right, right, and I was being very lazy. I should have gone up and come downwind over the target at about, I don't know, 26,000 or something. But it was more convenient to go against the wind because of all the other targets we had to cover. So we were a slow-moving target and the German gunners knew exactly where we were going to be. And uh, But I didn't, didn't see any flak until one burst right in that gap that I'd just think. And I tried to tell Bill, and I actually tried to say, this, this was uncensored, gosh, Bill Flack. I should have used a stronger term, and the voice didn't come out properly. It was a strange sort of uh, 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 noise in my earphones, and he's saying, what are you saying, what are you saying? And I told him, and he said, well, do something. <laughs> and so I turned, and there was an ocean of these 88 mil puffs and not one scratch on the aircraft. So the only time I really got hit was uh, doing a low level over the northern coast of Crete. And I remember there was a guy looking at me. Every, I was up and down looking for a radar site, and there seemed to be no air, German aircraft about, and there seemed to be no trace of fire or anything like that. So I went up and down a couple of times. And there was a bloke at one end when I was turning who was all, all seemed to be looking up at me like that in a grey suit. And I know I nearly waved to him at one stage. When I landed, I went to land and the uh, the flaps wouldn't come down. Uh, and that meant that I had no brakes either because the flaps and brakes were an air pressure system. And I, a Spitfire without flaps and brakes, gee, they, they, it takes a long while for them to slow down. And uh, I had about three or four attempts to land and realised I, I, I was going to 
across the road and hit the laundry, the Arab laundry up ahead. And I, on the final attempt, I, I kicked her up, left, lots of left rudder and let it bounce onto the sand alongside the runway, expecting it to go up on its nose, and it didn't. And uh, <laughs> the ground crew weren't impressed because uh, they wanted to know if I'd copped any flack and stuff. I said, oh, I don't know, I don't think so. They said, you stupid so-and-so, you nearly wrecked the best aircraft. It was a wonderful aircraft. And uh, I thought, you know, it's, you had certain aircraft that were a bit better than the others for some reason. And uh, this was our prize aircraft. And then one of the boys said, oh, look, and there was a hole in the tailplane. And then, oh, I said something naff like, oh, no, stone on the runway or something. And... Uh, I, I realised the guy I, I thought was just somebody looking up at me probably was a German officer in a grey field uniform with his luger. <laughs>